Uh, and welcome back to Little Gods, our weekly mini sword where we dig into the things that we've been watching recently. I'm Terry. And I am Mary Beth, and we are doing awesome. We are doing great. Sundance is over, lives. but we're still talking about Sundance today, uh, second half of our Sundance conversation, and we are talking about the last two seasons of Chucky, season one. Episodes. Yeah, that's what I meant. Episodes. That's what I meant. Last <laughs> two episodes. Like two seasons? Oh my god. How many seasons are there? <laughs> last two episodes of Chucky season There one. we go. I love it. Love it. Uh, uh, so, this is a new month. Um... If you're listening to this on Friday, there's a new seltzer out there. Uh, and the next week, we are unveiling our next Fresh Wounds, which is... Mary Beth? Where's my... Oh, Lake Mungo! I was like... It's like the, or- it's like the orphanage! Guys. Nope! <laughs> nope. No, we are talking about Lake here. Mungo... And as many of you who are listening to this podcast know that that is one of my all-time favorites. And Terry didn't like it his first watch, which we've given him shit about before, um, and revisited it for Fresh Wounds. And we have a really awesome discussion about one of my all-time favorite horror movies. Um, And it's a really good talk. I, I Just no spoilers, but foreshadowing. It's a really good conversation, and I don't yell at terry about not liking it so (laughs) it's okay it's an okay movie i mean i suppose look i accept all opinions except for that one (laughs) (laughs) just kidding no i uh i def uh, no no spoilers yep we'll we'll save that for next week yeah but yeah new month new new patreon stuff get into it if you aren't a patron, why not? Um, no, I understand. But we'd love your support and listening to our we'd extra content. Um, mm-hmm. Sign up. It's awesome. For just a dollar a month. It helps keep exp- the lies on. Lies on? The li- Lights on. <laughs> Jesus. You know the lie that I'm gay? I was gonna hey. make a joke about your hair being full of secrets, but you don't have any hair, so. <laughs> no, I don't. Very bald. Strap on, you guys. Keep the lies on. <laughs> oh my God, Kate! I, I think we need that on a shirt. I'm going to copy that. Strap <laughs> on, you guys, and keep the lies on. That is a deep cut that no one will get except for like a few people. But it's hilarious. Well, only the true fans know. Um. Anyway, look, cross stitch pillow pattern coming soon. Uh. Yeah. Would love, Ooh. would 10 out of 10 yes, please. would purchase. Um, but let's talk about Sundance. I know that Yes. I watched a few more. I, I ended up fizzling out more than I expected to, which I am giving myself grace for. It's like so easy to get sucked into this idea that you have to watch as many movies as possible to like prove yourself. But I'm just like, I'm like honestly kind of burnt out from watching movies because I love my job, but I have to watch so many fucking movies. Like, my head is just exhausted. And all I want to do is watch TikToks. Um, (laughs) I just want to consume short-form comedy content and turn off my noggin and not think critically about film. Um, But that aside, I watched 18 movies total, and I really enjoyed uh, most of them. So I'm excited to talk about some of the things that we watched that weren't Midnighters. But d- mm-hmm. deserve some love and attention. And a- some of these aren't even horror movies. I'm assuming you're probably not going to just talk about horror. Because I have a couple I watched that are not scary. That I s- want to I don't think any of the ones I want to talk about are horror this time. Cool. Well, tell me some. Okay. So, right off the bat, uh, one of the movies that I did see before Sundance that I wanted to talk about is this um, Lithuanian slash Swedish film um, called Slow. It is about um, a dancer who is very like, and yes, Kate, I'm going to, we're definitely going to talk about Cassandra, Cassandra tonight. Absolutely. Um, So it's about a dancer named Elena who um, is very in touch with her body and is very like huggy feely and very like sexual. And she meets a sign language interpreter for one of her dance classes, a um, Davidas. I probably mispronouncing that name 
and they start they, there's like a lot of chemistry between them they start hanging out um they start to dive into a new relationship and then she gets forward and he kind of pushes her back and tells her that he's um asexual oh and so it is one of the very few and for me probably the only movie i've ever seen that has like uh, it's a romantic drama i would say um with a character that is um very much thrives on sex and a character that is um asexual but tries to make it work and um I really enjoyed this movie. It's a little bit sadder than I was kind of hoping. Yeah. Um, in terms of of how it kind of like maybe turns out, not to get not to spoil it, but this is not a. I don't know it. I thought it was very well done, and I thought it kind of maturely explored uh, messy relationships, um, particularly with people that might not be on the same wavelength, but have like so much love and respect between the two of them. And so it, this was. Um, I really enjoyed this one. Um, I just, I was not expecting it to kind of not be like a romantic comedy ending, shall we say. Jesus Christ. I just, every movie I feel like was so goddamn depressing this Sunday, <laughs> like especially yeah. so. We talked about this last time, but I've heard of that. I, I heard about that one. <clears throat> I didn't catch it. I didn't catch it. It's really it good. Though, but... I love ace representation. I love that we're getting more. Yeah. I know that something in the dirt had ace representation. And so mm-hmm. I like that that's kind of starting to maybe make its way into into film as like a thing that we can just have on celluloid. I don't know. But yeah, I like that. So that's my first one. Um, what about you, Mary Beth? Well, since you're talking about relationships and like complicated relationships, uh-huh. I wanted to bring up <laughs> Passages by Ira yes. Sachs. Did you see Passages? Oh, yeah. Okay. Passages, I'm, this was the one that I watched as, like, a, oh, I didn't just on my radar, because I, someone wrote a Twitter review, was like, it was basically, like, chaos bisexual, and I was like, well, like, I love that. Like, I like to call myself a chaos bisexual, but no, like, this is a literal, like, this is no, actually a chaos. It, this like, is, I joke about it, and, like, my chaos is, like, smoking a lot of weed. Like, this guy's, like, this character's chaos is, like, ruining people's lives. So, I, dysfunctional I, chaos. like, don't think I can call myself a chaos bisexual anymore after seeing this, because, like, I am not even remotely like not that. Not compared to Tomas, <laughs> so, that's okay. for sure. So, <clears throat> so, in, in this movie... Uh, Tomas, played by an absolutely incredible Franz Rogowski. Rogowski. Oh, he's so good. He's incredible. He's been in things like Undyne, Transit. Um, he is a German actor, so he's been in a lot of German stuff. But he plays Tomas, who is a German filmmaker. He lives in Paris with his husband, Martin, who is played by the fucking adorable Ben Wishaw. <clears throat> Cutie patootie. Oh, he was fresh in and fruity. Who? Friends? Friends. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Did you see that movie? Lucifer with a Z? No, I didn't. <laughs> like, it was at some festival. Oh. Huh. Anyway, sorry. I just realized this. I just put two and two together. <laughs> but, but yeah. So then he lives with his husband Martin, cutie tootie, fresh and fruity Ben Wishaw, who is the voice oh. of Paddington. Um, incredible. Oh, is he? Yeah, he is the voice of Paddington Bear never seen Paddington. Oh, if you want to feel good about yourself and just watch wholesome bullshit, Paddington is the way to go. It's Paddington 2 especially. That's what I've heard. Um anyway. <clears throat> so they are married. From the get-go you can tell it's to- it's pretty toxic. It's a- because it kind of like jumps right into the fact that Tomas has a affair with Agatha Agatha I think is how it's like Agatha with an E and it's French. It's probably Ag- Ag- Agatha. I couldn't really understand what they were saying in the movie because I am a it shitty. Sound like you're saying Agat. Agat. Okay, Agat. But played by the incredible Adele Exarchopoulos. I'm so sorry. I am the worst. But she was in um, Blue is the Warmest Color is kind of what she's known for. Oh. Um. She is. She's um opposite of Leah Sedu in that. Um, in that film but basically it's like a triangle of chaos because Tomas gets with her and is like oh you should be happy with me I'm with the woman and his husband is like why like what the fuck like this is this is weird it's 
it'll be fine and then it's not fine and then Tomas gets jealous of his husband moving on so then he wants to come back to his husband and it's just like <clears throat> Tomas try it's like the epitome of having your cake and eating it too and like trying to be that like that way and being so into your own ego but also incredibly insecure that you just like cannot handle people not wanting to be with you and it is again pretty sad um you're basically watching people's lives kind of crumble around a pillar that doesn't actually exist, um, which is a lot. But the characters and the performances are so good. And there was some, I think there was like minor Twitter discourse about the sex scenes in it. And I was like, we are so, like, people are so prudish. Like, the sex scenes were incredible. And I think a lot of people were saying this, but like, there's incredible gay sex scenes where Ben Wishaw tops friends. <laughs> Rogowski and it's just like a beautiful sex scene that is gay sex but like not sensationalized it's just two dudes like no it is actual like it like, is it is the most honest mm -hmm. depiction of sex but gay sex that I have seen outside of porn <laughs> like but it and like sad at the bar like like there's no bar but it is an incredible it's a really well directed scene it's very realistic it's not like yeah it's incredible and then there's it's incredible there's sex scenes like you know the typical like woman man sex but like all of the sex is just really well choreographed and it feels genuine it's not like mm -hmm. trying to make this crazy statement about look at him fucking all these people he's a bisexual fucking men and women it's like actual sex and it's not, yeah. And I just really appreciated the honesty of this movie. Yeah, this yeah. movie is 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 phenomenal. I loved from the very beginning. There's uh, because because Franz's character Tomas is a film director, and the opening shot is he's filming a scene for his movie Passages, and he, the way he like is trying to control every single facet of every single extra. <laughs> In this scene where he's like, one person's not walking down the stairs correctly, one person is not holding the glass correctly. Like, from the get-go, you can see that he has, like, control issues <laughs> and that he wants everything to play out as if he is manipulating it. And so the moment that um, Martin, his husband, is like, yeah, no, I don't think this is what I want. It is like a almost a coming-of-age story for him. It, like, just breaks his mind and he goes on this, like wild journey of figuring out what he wants but it's complicated by different sexes and different l ideas of love and pregnancy and like all of these things that it just sort of starts to tumble downhill and it's like i don't know i found it very enthralling the entire time i was watching yeah. it it also made me so mad um because a lot of the behavior yeah. that toma exhibits is a behavior i have experienced as someone who was in a very toxic relationship and so it was like i was so angry i wanted to turn it off but like in a and it's a positive thing because it's like very much accurate to the experience of like being in that kind of toxic dynamic and be and how hard it is to extricate yourself from that dynamic um so it, it's incredibly well done in that regard. So it pissed me off so much. But like, again, in a positive way, like in a way that like, wow, fuck, they really nailed it. I never want to watch this again because he's the most manipulative, gross, gaslighty person. <clears throat> in my opinion. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, he is. He's a horrible person. Yeah. But I felt that the, the movie had a little bit of empathy toward him, like not in a... He... Not in like a forgiving him sort of way, but there's like I think I think what this why this movie stuck with me more than it might have is because of the fact that it felt authentic in its depiction of him, both as like yeah, both as like a horrible person, but also as someone that like has that magnetic personality and that he obviously he obviously loves both people very much. It's just there's there's so there's a little bit more. I I think it's a little bit more nuanced than just a. Uh, you know, he's a bad guy. And I think yeah. that's why I appreciated this movie. Yeah. Even though he is incredibly frustrating. And I sighed so many heavy sighs during this movie because he is, he's a lot. He's a lot. Yeah. And I was like, how can you leave cutie patootie Ben Wishaw? Like, come on. Beautiful, fr like, 
Parisian apartment, a fucking country home. I mean, it's the gay ideal. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> he's a little Seriously. he's a little artist in his cute little artist butt pants, like his little butt and his little cute pants. Oh, whatever. Anyway. Yes, but I lo- I really like that one. Um I think there was a lot of really good queer stuff this year, I feel like. There was. Um, um, and speaking of queer stuff, I want to talk about Cassandra. Oh, so I'm Kate so mad I didn't up. watch it. Oh, Mary Beth. I know. So good. I just, I burned out. <laughs> I burned out. No, I get it. Like, uh, you said you watched, what, 18? Yeah. I watched, um, I watched 21. One was a short film, but I watched 21, and that was only because the last night I was like, I got to watch these two. And then Joe was like, hey, you got to watch this romantic comedy if you still can. Oh, I know. I missed that one, too. I'm so pissed I missed that one. That was really cute, too. But anyway, Cassandro, uh, telling the true story of Cassandro, who is an Exotico uh, Lucha Libre character created by Saul Armendares, Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, And he Mm -hmm. is a gay amateur wrestler from El Paso who rose to international stardom. It's set during like his rise of being like this this non exotico. So exotico are like a, a subclass of like lucha libre where they are the more fey, the more femme, the more queer oh, type character. Okay. <clears throat> and they're usually played for jokes. They're usually no one. The 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 rule was that exoticos never win. They are there for, to be the sort of like oh. audience yelling at point. And so he's going on on stage. Or he's witnessing people before he like transitions to being exotico from being um, sort of like a, a no a no note um, wrestler to being jeered at and having the f word thrown at him and like people the entire crowd just rallying against him him like winning and getting better and embracing his queerness and embracing the things that um, the audience hates and then the audience starts to come around. And so it's basically about his sort of rise and it's a fictionalized account. I was looking at the Wikipedia entry on him and seeing like how things lined up. So it's a little bit um, fictitious in the way it presents, but as biopics typically are. Um, But the main character, Saul, slash um cassandra is played by gail garcia bernal Ugh. who i just i absolutely love and this was a role made for him he just is electric in it he is he embraces this character so much i just i was it was a joy to watch him on on screen uh you get to see him interact with like a closeted um lucha libre fighter uh who they have like a relationship for that is he's married and so there's like a little bit of that going on there bad bunny is in it fuck yeah all right bad Who bunny i just realized is so fucking hot oh yeah bad bu- I, oh yeah oh huh. yeah bad bunny is a cutie huh. to put it very lightly he is a cutie he is and by cutie I mean hottie he's a he's a hottie Ugh. oh i'm so glad bad bunny loved. was in that <laughs> Yeah. Is Bad Bunny, I was like, is Who Bad is Bunny that? queer? Do we know? I don't know, but I do think his persona on stage is is more um like poly type feeling, but I'm not I know he's supportive. Okay, yeah, no, he's, he's supportive of the Okay, community. yeah, he's not he is not queer. Okay. But again, I think it's got like it's got like the Harry Styles vibes, but like a little less exploitative mm. of like I, whatever, a slippery slope of talking about queer writing with Harry Styles. Um, but I know that there's been a discussion about Bad Bunny, but it's more like he's like trying to be like, you don't have to be like super macho and you can lean yeah. into these kinds of like ways of existing without it being like, yeah. So yeah, I think he, yeah. And hey, that's what this film's about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> makes sense that he's in it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. If it's been picked up, I don't know. It has. It, it has. I don't know if I can say. It's an Amazon Studio film. I see. Yeah, it got picked up. Um, it's an Amazon Studio yeah. film. It looks like. So we'll, it'll come so. out. I think it's it's coming out later this year. So it'll be out for the world to see on pro uh, on Prime. So that was Cassandro. Uh, what do you have next, Mary Beth? So I, I have two more that I want to okay. really talk about, and the first one is Fair Play. 
Okay, when, one I did not get to see. This is this movie fucking ran me over. Um, it's really good, and it's a lot. It's a lot, but it's really good. So it's directed by Chloe Domont. I believe this is her first feature, and it's about a couple who both they both work together at a hedge fund in New York City, but no one knows they're together. And they've okay. been together for a couple of years. They live together and they actually, they get engaged, but they have to pretend they don't know each other at work because toxic, whatever. So she is one of the only women and she is, um, she basically is promoted to the job that she, her fiance thought he was going to get. And she thought he was going to get. Uh. So she gets, actually gets promoted. And as soon as she gets that promotion, her fiance completely switches when he no longer has like the perceived upper hand and the power dynamic Mm. of their relationship he immediately Mm. starts treating her like shit like gaslighting her and she's like trying really hard to be nice like she knows this is hard for him but basically it then like leads to this it's just like the absolute downfall of their relationship and it kind of how it spirals out of control and the power dynamics being challenged and male ego being kind of unwilling to check the ego at the door and not give respect to a person who deserved a job regardless of gender. Um, so this is the first time I've seen Alden um, Enrenreich, I think is his name. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. Alden Enrenreich, who is uh, Han Solo and Solo. First time I've actually like seen full proof that he knows how to act. I think he plays a lot of like goofy characters, but this character is... I think it works really well that, like, you assume he's going to be goofy and he's actually the fucking, like, worst. Playing against type. (laughs) Yeah. So, and then Phoebe um, Denever plays plays the lead. And I, she hasn't been in a lot before. She's pretty new. Okay. But she's electric. She's so good. And this, like, whole movie is about toxicity and, you know, toxic male relationships in the workplace, especially in, like, these high-powered workplaces that are very male-dominated, that are all about, like, partying all night and doing coke and, like, getting wasted and then, like, making tons of money. And it's kind of got that, like, you know, there's some tip, there's some, like, kind of stereotypical vibes here of, like, woman in the man's world and what she has to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, like, really well done in terms of examining that relationship so um it's not an easy watch there is a sexual assault scene um it's it's really well done it's just like it's very it's like it's not a horror movie but the tension feels like a horror movie um so yeah fair play yeah you had mentioned that and then i went to go see if i could snag a ticket and it was all it was all sold out so i i unfortunately missed that one but it's after you talked about it and i can't remember someone else talked about it too I was like, okay, it's on my list of things I need to watch eventually. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes out. Yeah. I'm not, it hasn't gotten picked up yet. Um, it's almost two okay. hours long, which is a lot. Like, it's kind of like, it's Oof. kind of like a marathon of a movie, but check it out if you're kind of into that. If you ever see anyone call this an erotic thriller, it's not. This is by okay. far the furthest thing from an erotic thriller, in my opinion. Okay. Just because it is a very high intensity movie about a woman in a man's workplace does not mean it is an erotic thriller there is nothing erotic about this movie not even a little bit i'm just letting okay. everyone know that now because <laughs> jesus <laughs> christ sense. but anyway passing it back to you anything that you want to highlight yes okay pivoting very hard from that is a movie that for some reason i think is my favorite of the fest which seems weird because it, it does feel like a little bit of a slight film in some regards, but um, Theater Camp. Oh my God, I love Theater Camp. I'm so glad you told me to watch it. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. So it's co-directed by Molly Gordon and Nick Lieberman. You might remember Molly Gordon from uh, her role in Shiva Baby, her role in Booksmart, um she is co-directing this and she co-wrote it along with um her Mm co-director and noah galvin who is in this movie as well as an actor 
Uh, and Noah Galvin is also from, he was also in Booksmart. He was in Assassination Nation. I think he kind of grew kind of popular from the real O'Neills. He was uh, Kenny O'Neill in that. But um, so Theater Camp is about, <laughs> it's sort of like a Christopher Guest movie, I would say, in that it is sort of like a mockumentary about this documentary crew that is going to go to this theater camp run by um, Amy Sedaris's Joan. And the first time they start filming, they are at Bye Bye Birdie, and the strobe lights cause her to have to go fall into a coma. And so they're going into <laughs> the summer season with their fearless leader in a coma and her son, played by Jimmy Ch- Tatro, who is also in another very funny mockumentary um, called American Vandal. Um, and he is like there trying to run the business and deal with theater people, <laughs> for lack of a better word. We have Molly Gordon and Ben Platt playing the the sort of like queer best friends who are also might be slightly in love with each other and codependent on each other. You have Noah Galvin who is playing Glenn, who is like working behind the scenes doing the, um, the, the stagecraft, but is actually quite talented, but no one sees it. You have like all of these characters. Um, oh, Ayo, I'm, I'm going to pronounce her, mispronounce her name. Ayo Adibri, Adib, Adibiri. Adibiri. Yeah. Ayo Adibiri. Oh, bitch. She's so fucking funny. Who's, so funny in this and she's also she was great in the bear that's where i first saw her she was so good in the bear and she's really funny in this and it's basically just cataloging the summer of um drama camp where they're trying to keep it together while their uh rival camp across the lake wants to buy them out and tear down their camp and so it's it's a it's very funny it i have i have thought for the longest time that my my ability to laugh at things has been diminished when it comes to movies, but I laughed so fucking hard watching this movie. This movie is a breath of fresh air. It's very funny. I told Mary Beth, I was like, you need to watch this. And I'm so glad you did because you enjoyed it, right? I loved it. I was watching it in bed and I kept going, I kept making my really off, like not even just a laugh, but like my <laughs> sound um, while I was watching it because like, so I was a former, I'm a former theater kid, as I know that Terry is also a former theater kid. And so I just, some of the shit that happens in this movie is just so relatable as people who are in theater, people who are around people who were even more into theater. Cause like I was a theater mm-hmm. kid, but like, I was not a theater kid. Um, and I'm not trying to differentiate myself. It's more like the people that I work, like, the people that took themselves like so seriously, I was like, oh fuck, like I am not even remotely on your level. <laughs> and like I love that. I just I was I just couldn't get there. It wasn't me. It wasn't for me. And that's fine. But that's why I, I just love this movie. Cause and again, like all of the kids at the theater camp are like, we're gonna be a fucking star. And I love that. Like there isn't uh-huh. like there is no like, oh, the kids who are really into it and kids are not. Like these kids are fucking into it. And it's just like Oh, they are. The 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 things that happen in this movie are like so, like it's dark and also really it, and funny. It feels even because it, it's not like dark subject matter, but it feels a little bit darker than like a Christopher Guest movie. Even in like the way it's filmed, it just feels a little bit more melancholy in a really interesting mm. way. Like bitter, I heard I read somewhere that someone described it as bittersweet, and I think that's a really good way yeah. to describe it because it's like. It's funny, but it's also about people who are in theater who are, like, are trying to figure out what to do with their lives and they don't want to let go of their passion. And, like, that's a real thing that a lot of us face and, like, wanting to, like, live our passions but then kind of realizing, like, maybe it's not a thing that is plausible. And Ben Platt and Molly Gordon... Ben Platt absolving all of the sins of dear evan hansen with this movie i know when i was going into this movie i was watching it with with my roommate and i was like oh this is gonna give me evan hansen vibes but no he's really he's good really this. good like he's in his element he's like wearing birkenstocks the whole time like mm-hmm. little like very like stereotypical like theater scarves and it's just it could have gone so hokey and it, it's but it's just hokey enough that it's funny and it I think they could have used the mockumentary um, 
technique a little bit better, but I also am a freak about pseudo documentary and mockumentary. So like, I, I know that's like nitpicky. Um, but I also know a Galvin's character is the best character in this entire movie. Oh, he's so good. The unsung heroes of the techies who are always like getting, I love tech week when like, he's the only person running around to everything like with his binders. I was like, Oh, like applause for the techies. Like we love techies so much. Um, and like his character arc is just so good. Like it, uh, it makes the whole movie to me. Like it's good uh-uh. without like it just it's. Ugh, Noah Galvin's character. The climax with him is just yes. so perfect. Oh. Uh. Yeah, it was it was the palate cleanser I needed for a lot of other things that I had watched. Yes. I think I'd watched Magazine Dreams like the same day, and that is like one of the most depressing movies I've ever seen. And I was like. I need someone to give me a mind wipe. <laughs> I, and I think that's why I, lo- I really responded to this one so much is that this was a very heavy year at Sundance, I would say, for a lot of the the movies. Um, and this movie just comes along and is like, hey, it's okay to laugh. And after, I think this was like, this was almost going to be my last movie of the fest. But after like watching so many dark movies, so many depressing movies, so many really good movies. Like I'm not discounting them, but watching all of those and then sitting down to watch this and just being blown away by the creativity and the humor and the heart, uh, just like it made, it made my day. And I, as silly as it might sound, this was probably my favorite movie of the fest. I mean, I get that though, especially when it, especially when it's like a little buoy of joy in like a sea of depression it's just, mm-hmm. it's easy for it also to stick out in terms of like, oh, this was doing something yeah. different. And mm-hmm. I really liked that. I think this was, this was one of the last movies I watched. And I was like, well, this is a good kind of foot note, like a good note to end on for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, I know it's being distributed by Searchlight Pictures. So we'll probably get an actual theatrical release of this movie. So um, those were the ones I really wanted to talk about. You theater, ca- me too. yeah. So let's just like pivot wildly into talking about Chucky, the last two episodes of Chucky. Oh boy. So I got to I got to hear your thoughts Mary Beth because uh we started the season and now we're we're ending it on such a dark note. Like what? Um I'm trying to like put all my thoughts together. I mean, they really did kill a lot of parents. These almost all almost of them. all of them. These poor children are just fucked. Um, oh yeah, they killed Junior, right? Yeah, Junior. So he's dead. Um, Junior's dead. Kyle's dead. Junior's dad's dead. Kyle died. Kyle might be Kyle dead. Kyle might be dead. We we didn't get confirmation on her. Um, there's an army of Chucky dolls now. Which I once again, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Like what? Vu do? power is happening um i still don't like fully get it but that's fine i mean i get it i get what he wants he wants to take over the world like have kids like possess children etc etc but still like what the fuck but again i'm thinking too hard into this um but i i love all these horror references that are going on in these last two episodes especially the last episode and there's some really interesting stuff they're doing with music in this as well that i was really excited about um I love that char that Charlie. <laughs> what who Chucky? What the fuck? Charlie. <laughs> My man Charlie. Um <laughs> just is a puppeteer of children, which is like the more I think about it, the creepier it really fucking is. Like, I hadn't really thought about it. You mentioned it, and then like just seeing him, especially like as the seasons progress, and he's like fucking poking and prodding a bunch of kids to commit murders it's like ew this is kind of squicky like this like why are you only targeting children to do all of your bidding like yeah i get it like easily manipulated and stuff but like these kids are got your shit and yet you're i don't know it's it's weird um i did also like how they kind of tied it all together with how tiffany called the cops on chucky and it all kind of like tied Mm -hmm. them them all all the stuff together i was like oh okay i like the cohesion that is created there um yeah it's like filling in little plot holes but also like moving a story forward yeah yeah exactly 
so I watched them back to back. So like I cannot remember what was in seven and eight. Like I mar- like I just so if I say something is in one episode, I swear I watched it. I just like cannot like I smushed it together like a movie. So it's like I cannot remember for the life of me. Um, I did. I will say I did know that Devin lived. Um, but only because I saw the first episode of season two. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, that was like a very a very like speed bump. When I when I first watched this, I was like, they. No, Don Mancini is not burying his gaze. He is not going to do that. And there was like a brief, like the next scene, they're reunited, everything is hunky dory. And I was like, okay. I know. <laughs> Beautiful kiss, calls him a boyfriend. Like, I just love oh, I just love the gays. I just love all the gay. And oh the the bound reference of Jennifer Chile saying, You're a bit young to seem bound. I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah. like all of the little things just make it bring my heart. Like, she is so good in this. Like I she it just fucking kills it as tiffany slash it i don't whatever whoever i i don't understand like who is who here it's like kind of like a hive mind. i'm gonna think of it as like a hive mind at this point but not really because they're not all connected i don't think so i don't quite understand like the identities of like who and they kind of try to get to that at one point of like who is the real Chucky? But then she's like, neither of you are men. I'm like, well, that didn't help me at all. <laughs> like, I thought you were going to give me something in terms of like who the real Chucky is. And if he's dead, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. But I, I'm i just, nit- again, nitpicking. But I just want to know, like, who is the real Chucky? Who is the real Tiffany? Because like, spoilers, at the fucking very end, Tiffany like has a gun and is pointing it at Andy. But... Jennifer Tilly. Tiffany the Tiffany doll. Tiffany the doll. Jennifer there's Jennifer Tilly, Tilly who's possessed is by... cutting t- off the arms and legs of Nika. Like. That's fucking bleak. Nika gets the shit I know. Poor Nika like, can't catch a fucking break. Like, she is just... Ugh. Called insane and go- sent to a, uh, you know, um, a, a, a sane asylum by the end of the first movie that she's in. Being turned into Chucky in the second movie she's in, now having her arms and legs lopped off and she's stuck in a wheelchair. Like, sorry about it. I guess like, it just, <sighs> it's yeah. It. Well, I, I also want to talk about like this like climactic moment where Chucky starts killing all the adult like the adults in the movie theater where he sits under the seats during the screening of Frank, the original Frankenstein. And he says his favorite part is when Frankenstein throws the little girl in say, the water, which is side note. Le- he looks at this huge guffaw, like this is my favorite part. And he then slides under the seats and just starts stabbing people through the seats. And like, we've seen him yeah. do this kind of like he stabbed at the bed towards the beginning and he's tried to do this mm-hmm. a couple times, but now it's like, really working and he is on a spree like he is just Mm -hmm. stabbing whoever he can get he can get to like kind of it's there's like indiscriminate just stabbing of people including um our bully's dad yeah incredible reveal about him being dead with the mom eating the popcorn and that it's blood on the popcorn (laughs) pouring out of his mouth like yeah oh it's so good and again this is all happening while frankenstein is playing in the background and also the score riffs on the Shining score. It does. Which was mm-hmm. so cool. So there's like so many really cool horror references going on here. Chucky gets a ghoulies moment when he pops out of oh, the toilet. Oh, that's right. Oh my God, that was incredible. So it's like, I think they like, there's a lot of horror references in the series, but I really think they like, f- like went into them. Because I feel like these last two episodes really tie again, like the new and the old together really well. Like mm-hmm. this is when everything kind of makes sense. And like everyone, we know that it's been coming together, but now it's like all these, all of the characters that we know and love and the new ones all come together in this like crazy two episode finale. Um, Kyle is wearing her outfit from Child's Play 2. <laughs> why not? <laughs> I just love this idea that she's like, you know what? I was really rocking that style back in the, late 80s early 90s early 90s. and i'm going to bring back this black leather motorcycle slash somewhat like snme look as an adult and i'm just like i see no problem bravo. with it bravo. she looks great she does i just love i'm wondering if she's dead i don't really I, know i just i feel like 
I, I say this about a lot of stuff, but I feel like they show you when people are dead so often in this mm-hmm. show that, like, I can't imagine that they would kill her off like that. Yeah. My only, like, real complaint is the ADR is not the greatest in these episodes when it comes to uh, the Dorif and Tilly voicing. Oh, I don't... Yeah. The, yeah. It looks like bad lip syncing. Like, it looks like it's just, like, a hair off or, like, they are over-accentuating yeah. their mouth. And it doesn't It doesn't line up. I wish they had just, like, had... I don't know. I, I think it... That wasn't... That's, like, the one stylistic choice where I'm like, ooh, I don't know about that. Like, that's weird. Um, Like, you're already letting his daughter play him as, like, a hot young dude. Like, let's just let her have... Like, she can kind of get the voice and the laugh. Like, fuck it. Also love when Ch- Chucky as Nika and Chucky the doll are talking about how he gets so much pussy when, she, when he's a woman. Uh-huh. And Dick. And Dick. I was like, good for Chucky. <laughs> Canonically bisexual? <laughs> <laughs> at least one side. At least, yeah. <laughs> at least one little fragmented being of his is that. I don't fucking know. Yeah, how did. How? Fine, fine, fine. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. There's no explanation. I have to just give into it. There is not. There's not. I'm like, how did that happen? Nope. What I do love, though, is the way it ends with Chucky as if he's, like, reading classic literature to us. And he, like, compares Mancini to Shakespeare, which I was just like, okay, that's funny. It's just so good. And then it goes through all the kills, 21 deaths this season, and to quote Chucky, and a whole bunch of dead parents. (laughs) I love it. Which, seriously, there is literally one main character parent alive we have the entire (laughs) poor (laughs) jake's family his entire family his extended family dead gone he's it devon mom dad orphaned lexi loses her boyfriend slash loses one half of her parents very vicious this this series was very vicious at least this first season Seriously. I, again, like, it's like, well, uh, so what? What next? Um, and I'm excited because I know that there's a lot of stuff with, like, boarding school and Jesus and stuff. So <laughs> I'm excited to see how they handle that. I've heard, again, really good things about it. So I've only seen the first, I think, two, maybe three episodes of season two. So, like, I haven't. We're going to get into things that I don't I, I don't know. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for it, too, because I also the first episode of the second season and was like. <laughs> I can't imagine because the second episode, like, kind of picks up in some ways right where this one leaves it off. It does. Like, I, it all kind of started making sense. I was like, oh. And I didn't watch any other episode. I was like, I just I'm lost. I need like this is not a show I can do this with. But um, yeah, I it's 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 so goddamn good. I'm excited to jump into season two, and I'm they're doing. Did they yeah. announce a season three? Right? They have. They've announced season three. So hell yeah, I love it. But yeah, so I'm really excited. Next week we're going to start season two. Unfortunately, this one is not streaming free anywhere yet. Damn it! <laughs> God damn it! It was so easy on Peacock. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it is like I, when I, when I look it up, it, it's, uh, cause I, on the iPhone, the nice thing about Apple TV is that it pops up with like, where oh. things are available and it says it's available on like the Bravo TV app, but I don't know if you need to have like, I'll figure it out. Cable subscription for it. I don't know, but I'll fi- I always find some way to watch these things. Um, but yeah. And so that's, that is next week. That's what we're talking about next week. But who, who, who are we talking to on Monday, Mary? All Bell? right. So, like, this was the coolest shit of all time um, oh. because I have loved this director since I was a fucking weird ass high school student. We are talking to Ryuhei Kitamura, who was the director of the Midnight Me Train versus and the newly released The Price We Pay. And he brought with him the classic film Phantasm, which is now one of my favorite movies after watching it for a second time and chatting with him. First time watch for me. Oh, fucking incredible discussion. He's so cool. Um, I share with him my obsession of Midnight Me Train, and it's really awesome. It's like a cool kind of full circle moment for young horror fan Mary Beth to now. So I'm really stoked for everyone to hear that. 
episode. Yeah. What a nice dude. He's so he's so cool. So his chill. stories are cool too. He's got a he lot. He loves to tell stories. He has a very funny story about the first time he came to America yeah. and buying a car. It's really funny. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, he was just really generous with sharing about his his yeah. experiences. So yeah. Well, listeners, you've heard from us. We want to hear from you. Is there a Sundance film that we talked about that you're especially excited for? Um, what did you think about Chucky season one? You can let us know by sending us an email at scarredforlifepodcast at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to us directly on Twitter. I am at MD McAndrews. And I'm at Gailey Dreadful. And of course, don't forget to follow the podcast on Twitter at Scarred Podcast. And please don't forget to review, rate, subscribe. Join us on Patreon. You could be watching us live do this as Perperina and Kate are doing right now. Uh, and then, like we said, Fresh Wounds next week. Like Mungo. Very cool. So join us. Support us. Support us. Yes. Thank you. Bitch. Um, thank you to Eric Tyre <laughs> for our artwork. Thank you to Sean Keller for our music. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please stay safe out there. But most importantly, stay creepy. And until next time. Bitch. <laughs> oh, won't somebody please think of the children?